Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our event this afternoon. I still see the numbers going up, so I think we'll just wait another minute before we kick things off. Great. Well, welcome, everyone. Welcome to our book event with Lauren Redness on her book about Oak Flats. It's wonderful to welcome all of you today. Uh, my name is Sybil Francis. I'm the um, president and CEO of the Center for the Future of Arizona, and I'm really delighted to be uh, partnered with New America and um, uh, the Center for the Future of War to bring you this event uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's nice to see some hellos through the chat. Thank you so much. Um, I just finished reading the book this weekend, and I think you're in for a real treat to hear from Lauren about directly from her about the book. But I did want to start off by thanking Daniel Rothenberg of the Center for the Future of War, as well as our colleagues at New America for co-hosting uh, this event today. I know you all through the Center for the Future of War have had numerous events together, but this is the first time that the Center for the Future of Arizona has joined you. So I thought I'd just say a few words about uh, the center and why we're here and why uh, we um, are so delighted to work with Lauren Redness as one of our new Arizona fellows. Uh, but the Center for the Future of Arizona or CFA is a nonprofit 501c3 uh, organization. And our mission is to bring Arizonans together to create a stronger and brighter future for Arizona. And we do that in a number of ways. We listen to Arizonans very carefully about what matters most to them. Uh, that helps us set our agenda. And we actually do that in multiple ways. And one of them is with it through a unique partnership with Gallup. Uh, we share trusted information uh, with Arizonans about how we're doing on the things that matter to them. We help identify important issues to the future of Arizona. And then we work with communities and leaders across the state to help them to bring data to the conversation, help them identify issues that matter to them and uh, help them create the change that they wanna see. So how do the new Arizona fellows uh, work into this? We've been, as I said, we've been thrilled to partner with uh, New America uh, uh, that you're familiar with uh, to bring one to two fellows per year to Arizona. And we really select those fellows uh, for, for being able, in the hopes that they'll bring uh, insights and, and new knowledge to our conversation in Arizona about our future. It doesn't always have to touch directly on a specific issue in Arizona, but something that can help stimulate conversation. Uh, in Lauren's case, in fact, she, her, the focus of her work is very much Arizona-based, so we'll, we were very thrilled about that. So the new Arizona Fellows are a way to bring conversations to the table, uh, stimulate thinking on things that are important to Arizona's future. So with that, I would love to turn to introducing Lauren to you. Uh, we're really proud to call Lauren one of our new Arizona Fellows. Uh, she came on a few years ago uh, when she was working on the book uh, about Oak Flats. And it's so exciting, Lauren, to see it come to fruition to have you here today. If you look at her previous work, she has wonderful, a wonderful, in fact, I would say wondrous way of bringing human, spiritual, artistic, and technical subjects together to tell compelling nonfiction stories. We were just speaking before we started today about her interest in, in science and bringing science and, and human issues together. She is the author of three works of visual nonfiction. One is Thunder and Lightning, Weather, Past, Present, and Future. Uh, the second book is Radioactive, Marie and Pierre Curie, A Tale of Love and Fallout. And the one we're going to be talking about today, Oak Flat, A Fight for Sacred Land in the American West. Uh, her book on thunder and lightning won the 2016 Penn E.O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award. And Radioactive was a finalist for the 2011 National Book Award, the first work of visual nonfiction to be so recognized. As I mentioned, she has a wonderful way of bringing, at least to my eye, science, art, and humanity together. Uh, her writing and drawing have appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times, which nominated her work for the Pulitzer Prize. And she teaches at Parsons, the new school of design for design in New York City. I wanna thank you, Lauren, for being with us today. We'll turn to you now for your talk, but before Doing that, I do want to just recognize um, Stephen Tepper, Dean of the ASU Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts, who will help lead the conversation after Lauren's presentation. So thank you, Stephen, for joining us for that. 
And just a quick reminder, if you have any questions you wanna ask, please put them in the chat and we will find a way um, to at least uh, post a few of those questions uh, during uh, the Q&A session with Stephen. So with that, Lauren, thank you so much for being here today. I'm so excited to hear your presentation and the conversation and I will now turn myself off Zoom and turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Sybil. I'm completely delighted to be with you all here tonight. Um, many thanks to ASU, to the Center for the Future of Arizona, to New America and the Center on the Future of War. Um, I wanna especially thank Sybil Francis, Daniel Rothenberg, Stephen Tepper, Awista Ayub, um, Sarah Belin, Megan McWenney, Matt Oxford and Selena Daniel. Um, Many, probably most of you are aware of the land rights struggle at Oak Flat in Southeastern Arizona. Um, as I'm sure you know, the situation is ongoing. So I thought we could talk about those very most recent developments in the Q&A. In the United States, um, we're often taught to think of conflicts between indigenous peoples and the settler state as distant history. But what we see here is that it's not just history, it's it's current events. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you. So wish me luck. Okay. Okay, there we go. Is that working? I don't know, but someone let me know if it's not. Okay. Um, tonight I'll speak with you primarily about this most recent book, which was published this past November. Um, but first, because my work is a little bit unconventional, I thought I'd give you a little bit of background. As Sybil said, for a while, I have been writing these visual nonfiction books. They're not children's books or graphic novels. I report, research, and write the texts, you know, like any nonfiction journalist would, and then I create the book's artwork. I design the layouts of the pages, and I often design a typeface for the book. My goal is to create a blend of, um, prose narrative and images that together generate some ineffable third thing in the friction between those forms. Each of these books that you see here weave together long form prose narrative and artwork in different ways depending on the subject matter. In my first book, I used archival material to create photo collages. And in another book, about the physicists Marie and Pierre Curie, I made cyanotype prints. In my third book, Thunder and Lightning, which is about climate and weather, the images are copper plate etchings. I like to use the physical form of the book as a storytelling tool. So the element of surprise is built right into the object itself. You never know what will be revealed when you turn the page. This is a spread from Thunder and Lightning. It's a, a chapter about the phenomenon of fog. I wanted to generate a sense of disorientation in the reader, that, that feeling of being lost in the fog. So I obscured all visible landmarks and you see these big amoebic forms, but you're not really even sure you see them. And this goes on for page after page after page upper page. So you begin to wonder if your eyes are playing tricks on you. In the past, like I said, I've designed new typefaces for my books. I want each project to have its own personality. And in the case of Oak Flat, I wanted the book to feel raw and direct. In fact, the typeface in Oak Flat is not handmade. It's Garamond, it's one of the most common fonts, because in this case, I wanted the text to be what typographers refer to as transparent. Unlike in my previous books, where the text is often woven directly into the images, in Oak Flat, I wanted readers to barely notice it. So you're just reading along. And the drawings are mostly representational. They're portraits and landscapes. I wanted readers to meet the people, and to see the places, small towns, sacred sites. 
outer space. And when the book veers into the supernatural, the artwork reflects that. I wanted readers to spend time with these people and in these places so that the outcome of the land rights struggle that's at the heart of the book would matter to them. The images that I'm gonna show you today, like the ones you've just been seeing, are mostly pages from the book. And I've also included some reference material, some um, photographs. The conflict at Oak Flat has received a fair amount of media coverage recently, so you might be up to speed, but just in case, I'm gonna give a brief overview. Oak Flat is about 70 miles from Phoenix, a little over an hour, depending on traffic. The United States says Oak Flat is public land, part of the Tonto National Forest. But to the Western Apache, who are indigenous to the area, Oak Flat is their traditional homeland, it's unceded treaty land, and it's holy ground. If you visit Oak Flat, you can climb on the volcanic rocks, sit under old growth oak trees. You might see a bobcat or a bear or an ocelot wander through the site. You can find refuge in the natural waterways, the shade and the breeze. At Oak Flat, there are ancient petroglyphs. You can see evidence of different types of dwellings. Pottery shards have been found. Archaeologist John Welch has called the area the best set of the Apache archaeological sites ever documented. In the past, Oak Flat was a burial ground and it continues to be a place where Apache people come to gather important foodstuffs and medicinal plants. Apache families hold important religious ceremonies here, including a coming of age rite for girls called the Sunrise Dance. So let me just say here, I'm not indigenous and I don't pretend to speak for indigenous people. I'm a journalist and in my book, I relay the voices of Apache people with whom I've spent time. The details that I relate about Apache religious ceremonies and in particular the sunrise dance were shared with me by women and girls who narrate the memories of their own dances. The descriptions of particular moments and the drawings that I do of the sunrise dance are based on my own experiences when I was invited to attend sunrise ceremonies. During the four days of the sunrise dance, a girl who has recently begun menstruating symbolically reenacts the Apache creation story. The girl is said to enter the spirit world and possess the supernatural powers of the Apache Mother Earth figure known as White Painted Woman. She's required to run and dance for hours. It's a test of physical and spiritual fortitude. The ceremony is central to Apache community and culture. In 1995, the largest known untapped copper deposit in North America was discovered beneath Oak Flat. The minerals in the deposit, based on today's price of copper, are valued at approximately $140 billion. The discovery of the copper ore triggered a race to get the minerals. Two of the world's largest mining corporations, BHP and Rio Tinto, teamed up to create a subsidiary company called Resolution Copper to try to access the ore. Resolution Copper promises that a mine here would create thousands of jobs and generate other economic benefits. Copper is a really interesting material. It's everywhere. Copper has been called the metal of the information age. We would not be together on the Zoom call without the benefit of copper. That's because high-speed internet connections depend on copper cable. Your smartphone relies on copper, home heating systems that get us through the winter, and air conditioners that make the summer tolerable all rely on copper. Cars, planes, trains, subways all rely on copper. Renewable energy sources like wind and solar use about four times more copper than conventional energy to generate one megawatt of power. An electric car like a Tesla requires triple the amount of copper used in a conventional car. 
the World Bank has said, we'll need to increase our usage of wind and solar by 300% in coming years if we wanna keep global temperatures from rising more than two degrees. Resolution Copper argues that we need its mine because copper is essential to building this clean energy infrastructure. Because OFLA has been considered by the United States to be public land, national forest, Resolution Copper needed Congress to pass legislation to access the ore deposit. For a decade, lobbyists and politicians tried to make this happen. You may remember the earliest efforts to enact a land exchange deal at Oak Flat were derailed because of a corruption scandal. Other efforts failed because of pushback from native activists, mining reformers, and environmentalists. But in 2014, Senator John McCain added the land transfer legislation as a rider to a military spending bill, the National Defense Authorization Act, legislation that included, for instance, the entire budget of the Pentagon. The rider was added just before midnight the night before the bill came up for a vote. The bill passed and a few days later, President Obama signed it into law. So what do we mean when we say land exchange? It's really just a fancy way of saying a trade. The US gives the mining company Oak Flat, this 2,400 acre parcel, and the mining company gives the government a number of land parcels elsewhere around the state. The copper deposit at Oak Flat is said to be about the size of this nearby mountain. The ore is estimated to be 1.5% copper with trace amounts of other minerals. Resolution Copper plans to mine the ore with a process called block caving. So in block caving, after the ore is extracted, it's pulverized into tiny particles and processed with chemicals to separate out that 1.5% copper. With the copper and the trace minerals removed, you're left with about 98% of the rock, you know, picture this mountain as toxic waste. That mountain of waste has to go somewhere. The leftover material is a kind of slurry called tailings. Mine tailings often contain lead, mercury, or arsenic. Resolution Copper's preferred option is to create a tailings facility on public land just outside the town of Superior, Arizona, but no, two miles from a plot. Um, the facility would be between three and seven times larger than New York City's Central Park. Tailings dams are among the largest human built structures on earth. Some scholars say that over time, there is a 100% chance that a tailings dam will fail. In 2019, a tailings dam in Brazil collapsed. The area was submerged in 15 million cubic yards of waste. 259 people were killed and 11 people remain missing. A couple years earlier, a different tailings dam about 50 miles away, also in Brazil failed, um, also killing people and animals, also destroying homes and contaminating land. That facility was run by BHP, one of the parent companies behind Resolution Copper. Even if a tailing dam does not suffer this type of catastrophic breach, its contents can seep into the ground or the water supply or filter into the air as pollution. The block caving process has other environmental implications. When the rock is removed, it leaves a void and the ground surface above that displaced rock begins to cave in. Eventually it will create what's called a subsidence crater. If the resolution copper mine goes forward, Oak Flat would collapse into this giant hole. Resolution Copper is not an American company, it's a British Australian company. Those who stand to profit most from the mine would not be the same as those who will bear the greatest burden of its impact. Rio Tinto, the majority owner of Resolution Copper, this past spring destroyed the Yukon Gorge rock shelters in Western Australia. These rock shelters were 46,000 year old and sacred to the local indigenous peoples. 
in the wake of that incident, there is an enormous public outcry. Rio Tinto conducted an investigation. They apologized. The CEO resigned. The company put out a statement saying they were committed to rebuilding trust with indigenous peoples. They said they would, quote, never again allow this kind of tragedy to occur. Yet in the United States, the company has not changed its plans that would allow another indigenous sacred site to become collateral damage in an extractive project. In the media, the conflict over Oak Flat has been framed as native rights versus economic prosperity. And the issue is portrayed as a choice, a debate between competing worldviews. People that prioritize native rights are against the mine. People who, that put jobs and tax revenue first are in favor of the mine. I think that framing is flawed in part because I believe that the mine's economic promises are misleading. As we mentioned, the market value of the ore under Oak Flat based on today's price of copper is about $140 billion. The market value of the lands to be swapped in exchange have been appraised at approximately $7 million. In other words, the value of the copper that would go to a private foreign company is 19,000 times greater than the lands the people of Arizona would receive in exchange. Apache opponents of the mine don't emphasize this discrepancy because for them, there's no monetary value that can be placed on this land. Resolution Copper asserts that the mine will create a ripple effect of economic benefits. The company envisions newly bustling community with more people, restaurants, schools, and so on. But if we look around the area to towns where other mines have come and gone, we don't see evidence of this kind of positive impact having been created or sustained by previous mining projects. In fact, studies show that mining repels economic diversification. According to Resolution Copper, their mine would only exist for 40 years. After that, the jobs will be gone, the area will be left with an enormous hole and a lot of toxic waste. The conflict over the proposed Resolution Copper Mine is the backbone of my book, but contrary to what I may have led you to believe thus far, this book is not really an issue book. The book situates this struggle within other timescales, the history of Anglo-European conquest in which we see the conflict at Oak Flat as a 21st century information age update of an old story with the copper standing in for the gold that brought conquistadors to the Americas 600 years ago. Or we can look to more recent American history for parallels. In 1830, Congress passed the so-called Indian Removal Act, which forced 80,000 indigenous people off land in the Southeast where they had lived for generations, pushing them onto largely unmapped territory in what is now Kansas and Oklahoma. It was a land exchange. The US took possession of the traditional territories of the Cherokee, Creek, Choctaw, Seminole, and Chickasaw peoples and offered them vastly inferior lands to which they had no connection. A motivating force behind this Indian Removal Act was capitalism, the drive to exploit land for private profit. The legislation was, desi was desired by Southern planters. Um, the effort was supported by Wall Street investors with international backing from Europe. So 200 years ago, we see an almost uncanny echo of what is unfolding today at Oak Flat. The book pulls the camera back further still, situating this corner of Arizona within a cosmic time scale, where we see the formation of copper taking place in dying stars billions of years ago prior to the formation of planet Earth itself. The book is also a generational saga. It tells the story of two families. One of the families is an Apache family, the Nosies. 
This is Wensler Nosey. He's the former chairman of the San Carlos Apache tribe. And Wensler Nosey is also the founder of Apache Stronghold, which is the movement that has led opposition to the resolution Coppermine. Wensler and his wife, Teresa, have six daughters, a son, and 14 grandchildren. Their eldest granddaughter is Nalin Pike. Nalin first testified before Congress against the mine when she was 14 years old. Nalin, along with her two younger sisters, talks about the importance of Oak Flat for Apache cultural survival. They talk about their own sunrise ceremonies there. At a court hearing just last month, Nalin described Oak Flat as the dwelling place the dwelling place of supernatural spirits called the Gon. The land itself, the plants and the rocks, she explained, have been imbued with life by the creator. She called Oak Flat a corridor to Apache religion. When I go there, she told the judge, my prayers go directly to the creator. That can't happen anywhere else. Oak Flat is also where Nalin and her sisters go to be with family, to swim, and even to skateboard. The book also follows a mining family, the Gorms, whose patriarch was the first sheriff in the town of Superior. Superior, as I mentioned, is a small town just adjacent to Oak Flat. This is Main Street around 1918 when Patrick Gorham, what's here? when um, Patrick Gorham became sheriff just six years after Arizona became a state. There were no elected officials in town. Sheriff Gorham's daughter, Patricia, told me, daddy made up the law and he enforced it. That meant, for instance, if a minor was thrown in jail for fighting or for visiting one of Superior's three brothels, Sheriff Gorham made sure the man was released before he missed his shift at the mine. Gorham and his wife, Molly, had 11 children. Mary, Patrick, Peter, Barbara, James, Thomas, Loretta, Jackie, Daniel, Philip, and Patricia. The Gorhams have stuck it out in Superior through tough times, even after the last mine closed and half the population left. They see the Resolution Copper Mine as an opportunity for their children and grandchildren to make a life in this place they love. For the Gorms, Oak Flat was also the place to go parking. I feel like that's not a word that probably we use too much anymore. It just means like hooking up, but in the park. Um, it was also where they'd go fishing and camping and to find peace and quiet. Almost all the Gorms worked in Superior's last mine, either underground or at the smelter where the ore was processed. Jackie Gorham talked to me about working underground in a world that could be totally devoid of light. He talked about getting disoriented and lost and the terror that would set in. There are pages in the book that are completely black to suggest this kind of bewildering darkness. In these underground tunnels, water would drip from the walls and ceiling. One retired miner told me, the mine makes noises. The ground heaves, it creaks. After lunch, the men would turn off their headlamps and doze for a few minutes. When they'd switch their lamps back on, all the cockroaches that had crept out in the darkness would skitter for cover. The color of black plays an important role throughout the book. It's the darkness of these underground tunnels. It's the black of outer space where the copper is formed. And the color black plays a role in another story that I came upon in my reporting. These are the 5,000 foot cliffs that loom over Main Street in Superior. If you're familiar with Superior, you know it's a dramatic setting, it's cinematic. Superior appears in um, Oliver West's U-turn with Sean Penn and Jennifer Lopez. Superior was in How the West Was Won with Gregory Peck and Henry Fonda. And it was in The Gauntlet with Clint Eastwood. The first time I met members of the Gorham family, we sat in a cafe on Main Street in the shadow of these cliffs. The cliffs are known 
as Apache Leap. If you spend time in Superior, you'll eventually hear the story of how Apache Leap got its name. A group of Apache a group of Apache warriors were cornered by enemy soldiers, and rather than surrender, they jumped from the cliffs to their death. People might give you different details. Sometimes you'll hear that the incident occurred in the 16th century, and the Apache were trying to be trying to avoid being enslaved in Spanish gold mines. In other versions, the enemy was another native tribe or a group of Mexicans, or the date is much later, and the enemies are hostile white ranchers. The most frequently told version, though, describes a 19th century confrontation between the Apache and the US cavalry. There's a second part of the story. People say that when the men jumped to their death, the Apache women cried. And as their tears fell to the ground, they were transformed into black stones. These black stones are known as Apache tears. You can find them in the area around Apache Leap. In fact, the stones are obsidian, volcanic glass. People polish them, turn them into jewelry, or um, hang them on keychains. In the 1960s, Johnny Cash became interested in Native American history. He was given an Apache tear stone. He had it made into a necklace. And then in 1964, he recorded a song called Apache Tears for his protest album, Bitter Tears, Ballads of the American Indian. Hoofprints and footprints, deep ruts the wagons made, the victor and the loser came by here, no headstones, but these bones, rend mescalero dead bones, see the smooth black nuggets by the thousand lying here petrified but justified are these apache tears you can find apache tears for sale as good luck charms in superior i found one online gem wholesaler that advertised apache tears saying whoever has whoever has one never has to cry again because since the Apache women do the crying in their place. Apache Leap is 1,500 feet from what would be Resolution Copper's deepest mine shaft. Superior's annual town celebration, which hosts staged mine rescues, drilling competitions, and a parade with homemade floats, is named the Apache Leap Mining Festival. Its main sponsor is Resolution Copper. I spoke to a resident of Superior named Albo Guzman, a friend of the Gorham family. Albo Guzman runs a sand and gravel business. In 1941, Albo's father, Mike Guzman, staked a claim for a small mine at the base of Apache Leap. Soon after, he discovered that his mine was full of obsidian. And that's when Albo says his father made up the story of the women's tears turning into stone. Albo told me, my dad came up with this idea. He made it up and it went like wildfire. Mike Guzman dubbed the mine Apache Tear Caves. It became a tourist attraction. Guzman charged people 50 cents a day to fill a gallon bucket with all the Apache tears they could find. People came from all over the US, from Germany, from Spain, beyond. Albo Guzman remembers his dad inventing the story about the Apache tears. It was a marketing gimmick. He thinks that the other part of the story, the part about the warriors jumping, is also fiction. He told me, that was made up in the 1800s. It's just an old bullshit story. There are a lot of old bullshit stories about the American West. Some of these stories also create, also contain kernels of truth. The Apache Tears story fascinates me because it's a case study. We see how big themes of the West, the wars of conquest, the struggle to control the land and the minerals that lie beneath it, the resource extraction, the violence, the tragedy, the profiteering, the hard sell, are assembled into myths that become what we call history. 
In fact, obsidian also plays a role in Apache culture and mythology. Apaches have long used obsidian to make tools, weapons, and ritual objects. Multiple versions of the Apache creation story invoke obsidian. In these stories, obsidian is sometimes referred to as black metal. In Apache cosmology, obsidian is associated with powerful forces that whip over the newly formed earth, black wind, black water, black thunder. I spoke to Wenzler Nosy about obsidian, but he didn't use the word obsidian. He used the Apache word. That word is vecine. Native words are all around us. 26 of the 50 United States have native names. Alabama, Alaska, Connecticut, Idaho, Iowa, Kentucky, Michigan, Missouri, Nebraska, Ohio, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Wyoming, and so on. Countless towns, rivers, streets, highways, summer camps, and commercial brands bear native names. There's the Jeep Cherokee, the Ford Thunderbird, Mazda Navajo, Dodge Dakota. There's Winnebago, Pontiac Firebird, Liz Claiborne's Crazy Hearse clothing line, Mohawk Airlines, Mohawk Floors, Sioux Suitcases, Apache Motorcycles, Apache Helicopters, Apache Oil and Gas Corporation, Apache HTTP is a free um, open source web browser. We can note the irony of the US Armed Forces adopting native names for many weapon systems and military operations. The Navy SEALs who stormed Osama bin Laden's compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan in 2011, relayed the news of bin Laden's killing to President Obama in the White House Situation Room by using the code word Geronimo. Geronimo, Geronimo, they radioed in. E-K-I-A enemy killed in action. Geronimo, of course, was the famous Chiricahua Apache medicine man who led resistance to the US Army in the so-called Apache Wars. Native rights advocate Susan Sean Harjo has said this choice of code name showed, quote, how deeply embedded the idea of Indian as enemy is in the collective mind of America. Native words are often so familiar that for many people, their origins have become invisible. Here we see a map of the country indicating traditional indigenous territories before colonization. In other cases, native place names have been replaced by Anglo-European names. Tonight, I'm speaking you, to you from Lenape, Lenape Hoking, the ancestral land of the Lenape people which is today more commonly known as New York City. Ojibwe historian Jean O'Brien has written, claiming is present in the very process of naming. When European settlers renamed a place, say redubbing Lenape Hoking as New Amsterdam and later New York, that act was an assertion of control and ownership. When settlers wrote histories of the places they moved into, they establish founding dates that serve to eclipse millennia of prior indigenous history. Every time you drive across town lines in the United States, you see examples of this on signage and monuments. O'Brien calls this first thing, the practice in which European settlers define themselves as the first people to establish civilization in one place or another. First thing served as a way to brush away indigenous societies as primitive, prehistoric, and for practical purposes, extinct. This ad attitude was then codified in US laws and court decisions. Anthropologist Keith Bassa worked with Apache tribes for four decades. He was close with Juan Zernozzi in working to protect sacred lands in Arizona. In his book, Wisdom Sits in Places, Bassa recounts his work with Apache consultants to create a map locating each and every place that bears an Apache name within a certain section of the White Mountain Apache Reservation. At one point while visiting sites, Basso repeatedly mispronounced a certain place name. Finally, he gave up and apologized to his Apache guide. I can't get it, he said, doesn't matter. 
this guide doesn't like Basso's comment. And Basso heard the guide mutter to himself, what he's doing isn't right. Why is he in a hurry? It's disrespectful. Our ancestors made this name. They made it for a reason. He's repeating a speech of our ancestors. He doesn't know that. The guide went on to describe how in the ancestors practice of naming a place, they made a picture of it with words. They could speak about it and remember it clearly and well. Now they had a picture they could carry in their minds. You can see it for its, you can see it for yourself. It looks like its name. Apache place names generally describe the physical features of a place, rocks, trees, rivers, and might even indicate a vantage point from which to view the place. An Apache elder might use place names to teach a child a lesson. The child is told a morality tale, which unfolds crucially in a specific place. In the future, whenever the child hears the name of this place, she'll be reminded of the lesson. In this way, quote, the land makes the people live right. Because Apache place names depict a place at a particular moment in time, they also mark time's passage. When the place changes, a rock tumbles, a tree falls, a river dries up. That name, instead of painting a picture of the place as it is, now conjures an image of what it once was. If the resolution copper mine is built, it will eventually destroy the place we've been referring to as Oak Flat. Oak Flat has a much older name. In Apache, the area is known as Chichil Il Bagutil, which roughly translates to Emery Oak extends on a level. The Chichil Il Bagutil, with its old growth trees and natural springs, were to collapse into a subsidence crater caused by the Resolution Copper Mine, the place would be destroyed. The name would linger in its absence. Thank you. L Lauren, thank you for that extraordinary presentation and for your extraordinary work. I wanna remind people to uh, put your questions in the Q&A uh, as, uh, as opposed to the chat. Um, and we will, uh, we will try to get to them um, in order. Uh, I'm just uh, amazed by your brain um, and uh, uh, you're a historian, you're a journalist, you're an artist, you're a researcher, you're a scientist. Um, if you could only pick two of those words, what would you say? Are, are you you're a journalist and an artist and what would be your two words? Those would be the two. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> and is there is there any tension between the journalism part of your brain and the art part of your brain? And if so, how do you resolve that? Gosh, that's really interesting. Um, I don't think of it as a tension, although I guess I could. I mean, I think of myself as really greedy and not wanting to choose. And that's why I decided I am not going to, and I'm going to do this re reporting in a somewhat traditional way, and then I'll make artwork and I'll find a way to weave them together because it feels like certain information is most meaningfully communicated in one media or the other. But are, do you find yourself making compromises where you're telling you there's parts of the story you want to tell um, and, and that may limit what you can do visually, or there's a visual expression that is so important to you, but that may limit the, the, uh, the text. Yeah, um, I try to use that. I mean, there absolutely are those limitations. I guess I try to make use of them um, and find creative solutions around them or have those limitations provoke me into something I wouldn't have thought of otherwise. And so I tend not to feel constrained by them, but kind of challenged by them. I don't know if that works, but yeah. that's, I guess, the hope. <laughs> that's probably a, pro a productive tension. Um, so we've got some questions coming in. There are two that are related, which is sort of the origin story of this particular book, Oak Flat. Um, how did you first hear about Oak Flat and why did you want to write a book about it? Yeah, um, I think most of my projects just start with a hunch. Um, there's like a seed of something that it usually 
don't know very much about, but I just, um, I can sense the complexity of it and I can sense that digging into it will, um, you know, be interesting and maybe thorny and that interests me. In this case, um, I actually pitched another book to my publisher and, um, and then I read an op-ed, just a really short op-ed in the New York Times about Oak Flat. And this must have been early 2015. And I just, you know, this was probably like a four, you know, maybe 600 word op-ed. And I was like, okay, that's it. That's what I'm gonna write about. And, um, and so I just started making phone calls. I started talking to Wenzel Nosy on the phone. I started making trips to Arizona and, um, and things opened up. And, um... So I, I, there's a there's a question here about advocacy. Um, so that was a word that I didn't describe: artist and activist, or journalist and activist. And I'm curious to know how you think about that role for yourself and in this book, um, and especially because I've I've read other interviews where you talk about the gray and the nuance and how you like to explore that space. And we tend to think of advocacy as more black and white positions. And even in this case, you tell the story of a, a mining family. Um, so what's the choice there? Because I mean, it seems like this issue is not so subtle, but yet you seem to be wanting to, to, to go at it in a, in a more subtle way. Yeah, I mean, I guess I feel like there are subtle aspects. And like you mentioned, the Gorham family, I feel like one of my priorities in um, you know, spending time with the Gorms and portraying them is to give them their full dignity and humanity. And um, they're just a wonderful family. And my point is not to um, create villains and heroes. My point is to hold maybe governments and institutions to account, but to give individuals, mm -hmm. um, you know, their full dignity and, um, and also to recognize the constraints of their position and their choices. Um, I definitely, this is definitely a, something I think about a lot. And um, I was recently actually writing to a friend about this exact question because I heard an, a journalist who writes about um, the climate, you know, climate change a lot, interviewed not that long ago and was asked a similar question. And she said, I plead journalism. And I thought that was such an interesting answer. And, um, and I respect it. I also think I don't want to let myself off the hook quite that easily. Um, so, I mean, I have written, I did write an op-ed for the um, Washington Post about this issue. So I feel like I kind of crossed over somewhere, but I feel like my book is not, um, is my, the book is not advocacy, but I have opinions. I'm on mute. Uh, we have a question again about the sort of style of presentation. Um, and so Megan asks, much of the book is presented as dialogue. How did you land on that approach? Yeah, oral history is really important to me and it's um, central to more or less all of the journalism and books I've done. I started doing um, these kind of off art pieces for the New York Times many years ago in which I would report on you know, various topics and use these kind of, almost like a play. I thought of them like plays and they were these kind of dialogues between different people. Um, and, um, and I like to, um, yeah, relay those voices kind of as directly as possible with, you know, as little of my own interference. Um, and I think, you know, that it's just a very straightforward way of like giving other people the floor basically. Um, so uh, you can't tell all stories. So um, were there voices that you came across that didn't make it into the vo into the into the book? Um, we have a, a question here from Sabrina about rock climbers who use the area and others who uh, engage recreationally. Um, were, or were there any voices that are not in the book that you feel are important to the story? Yeah, there were um, other people from Superior. There was. Um a wonderful woman um, uh, who runs a Chinese restaurant in Superior and who is, um, I think one of like maybe 12 children and her father and her uncle 
were um, sort of, two, you know, the um, patriarchs of two Chinese families in Superior. Um, and she had amazing stories to tell that at one point was going to be, you know, a chapter or two and just didn't seem to fit. So, so yes, there are, there are other, other people that I spent time with that. What, what was her perspective or what was, what was striking about her story? Oh gosh, um, I think, you know, you know, I think it, it again makes it less black and white, you know, it's native versus non-native and like what are all, all of these different complex dynamics of, of the, you know, who lives in the West. And, um, and I mean, honestly, it was so long ago, I'm gonna forget important things about her story. So I don't wanna say too much, but, um, but, you know, and also I think, you know, she, just people who, um, are so invested in the community and and also like see the mine as a positive, and maybe less worried about like what I might imagine would be really problematic at massive toxic waste dump. So I think just the way people navigate these challenges in their life is is really interesting. So I, I wanna uh, pick up on a question here about copper. Um, so I know in your process, you get fascinated and you're very curious about uh, technology and science and materials. Um, and so, you know, a lot of this book is about the history of copper. Um, so there's a question, just a, a big question. How, how badly do we as a society even need copper? Uh, can't we pay a higher price for it? Or is there, a is there truly a need to create new mines so that copper is, is cheaper? Um, yeah, I think that's such, an, I mean, it's such a critical question, maybe like the critical question. Um, I mean, I guess I think about it a couple different ways. Um, if, for instance, this copper deposit was never found, would the world keep turning and would we keep functioning as a society? I mean, of course, you know, like we would. Um, also, copper is 100% recyclable. Um, and as you say, there are um, raising the price and reducing different types of consumption. There's like other types of, um, I guess it call it urban mining, which, which is like, more of a recycling process um and apparently i don't you know this isn't something i've looked into extensively but i've i've heard that there are many existing copper copper mines that aren't functioning at full capacity so i think that there are a lot of ways that this you know this need could be addressed without um, going to new mines and i think it's also important to look at for instance the way this you know Resolution Copper sells the mine as, um, you know, in this way of like clean energy and all this, but there is no, as far as I am aware, provision in the law or in the general plan of operations that, that designates any proportion of the mined copper to clean energy. So it's not as if that we can know that would happen. Um, and also I think when you look at the way that BHP and Rio Tinto have functioned around the world, I think you need to question if in good faith they are committed to environmentalism. So back to the your process, um, this question about uh, how do you juggle your time uh, interviewing people, writing and recording those interviews, reflecting on those, drawing. Uh, so do you, you know, does the drawing come all later back in the studio or are you drawing on site? Uh, are you drawing from photographs? What's the creative process? It's kind of all of the above. Um, I, the writing and the reporting is the backbone of the story and I couldn't create the artwork without knowing what the text will be. At the same time, while I'm reporting, I am gathering all that material. I am drawing on location and taking a ton of photographs and I'm kind of, I have like a, almost like a hazy picture in my mind. So, so yes, it's sort of like somewhat simultaneous, but the artwork is much in a much rougher stage until the text is written. And then it's kind of a push and pull as I see them kind of interacting and reacting with each other. Uh -oh. um, we're so overloaded with information uh, in this world. And so you're trying to kind of find a, a new a route in to get people to pay attention and to have some emotional response to uh, 
you know, to, to difficult information, historical information. Uh, what is the role of art in kind of revealing information in new ways? And I sort of wonder how a documentary filmmaker who's combining journalism and art and storytelling might have approached something different. And are, are you, were you trying to evoke something different in feeling than a documentary filmmaker might have uh, if they had approached this project? That's really interesting. I mean, I think of drawing definitely involves um, asserting its subjectivity more explicitly. Like a, a photograph purports to um, be objective in a sense, right? I mean, every everyone who um, who creates an image is editing, is making a choice. So um, there is no like perfect objectivity, but um, but drawing I think is more explicit about that and direct about it. And I I appreciate that. And I also think that. Um, in drawing, you you are always making choices about what to emphasize, what to leave out, what to, um, and I think that 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 um, that process um, is a kind of um, winnowing or focusing on, you know, what is um, you know, where you want to draw the reader or the viewer's attention, and um, you know what what the palette is. There's an emotional um, force to any color choices, for instance. Um, so I think I lost track of the, of the question. <laughs> um, no, that was good. I, so the emotion. So when someone finishes a book, yeah. you know, the the emotion that you want them to arrive at. In this case, what was, what were you hoping for in terms of the emotional resonance of the book? Um, I guess investment would be mm -hmm. what I would want people to feel like they care. Like they care about these people and about these places and about these questions, and um, yeah, and and seeing the significance of this place within you know, um, with within the the cosmic time and space, um, and in that like also recognizing that this place is um, has you know like. Um, is just one example of other sites around the globe where the stakes are as high and similarly in jeopardy. I guess it, um, to sort of link what you just asked with the previous question in terms of like what I want the book to be like or feel like, I think one thing that's really important to me is that the book as feels as a complete object is a pleasure to experience, even if the material is difficult. Um, mm. That you know, it feels good in your hand, that it's, you know, mm -hmm. a surprise when you turn the page, that the cover case and the jacket interact in an interesting way, that the end pages do something, that, yeah, that there's just like a sensuality to the experience of reading it um, that exists with the kind of content, but is also like maybe a kind of, um, I don't know, yeah, it's like a counterpoint maybe to the hard questions. Well, that's a that's a, a powerful thing in this moment because reading our Twitter feeds does not make us does not give us any sense of of beauty or 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 feeling for the world. Um, so we need objects that can both give us information but also make us feel very deeply and and get invested. We we thank you for the way you've combined these things in such power and such a powerful voice. We have so many great questions here, and I know we're sort of at time, but I do want to ask. A question about because um, you're also a teacher at, at Parsons, um, and so advice that you would have for young writers or artists or journalists who are interested in creating projects like this that really engage multiple disciplines and mediums. Um, what what do you tell a young person that wants to do something different, um, express themselves without the boundaries of a single discipline? What's the advice? Um, well, I hear a lot of my students say something like, well, I started this, but then I thought I should X, Y, Z. And I, uh, that word always catches me. And whenever I hear a student say, well, this is what I thought I should do, I say, let's question that, why? And I try to um, help the students find a way that feels most meaningful to express their ideas rather than, um, what seems familiar or appropriate or um, 
you know, conventional. So I, I guess I, I never um, would push a student or anyone to try to express something just arbitrarily, you know, weird or whatever, just, just to be kind of um, um, indiscriminately, um, you know, wacky. But if something can meaningfully be expressed in a way that isn't common, then there's probably a reason for that and listen to that and rather than twelch it and think, oh, that's, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not what I should do. I say, don't worry about this should. Follow what feels most meaningful. I'm, I'm gonna take us just, just beyond the hour because there's two other questions that I think are related and they have to do with, um, uh, with the reactions to the book and the people whose stories you've told and whether you've gotten um, any responses that have challenged or affirmed your reporting um, or uh, whether uh, the people you're reporting about, the Apache people have different sets of interests. Um, so how do you think about yourself as an ethnographer and journalist telling stories of other people and how they're reacting to that and how you're sort of validating your own hunches about whether you got the story right or whether you honored people appropriately or not. Yeah, that's what I lose the most sleep over. And um, and I think, you know, what I try to do is just be really clear in, you know, kind of communicating what I'm up to and keep in touch and have good communication with everyone that I'm working with, I'm spending time with, and who is generous to share their stories with me and their time with me. So, um, I was fortunate that before COVID, I did have copies of the book that I was able to give to the Nosy family. And that was an amazing experience. And I was very gratified and relieved that they were happy with the book and their portrayal and the drawings of them. And that was really wonderful. Um, I wasn't able to bring the book to the Gorms because of the coronavirus, but I mailed them copies and, um, and that also worked out. Jackie Gorham called me up and um, he's 89 years old now. And he said to me, honey, you did a nice job with that book. And I sighed a big oh. sigh of relief. <laughs> well, on that uh, uh, also talented accent, uh, good, uh, a, good, a good Western accent there, almost as good as Johnny Cash. Um, we want to thank you, Lauren uh, Redness, because you're a, a, just a fantastic gift to the world. Uh, your uh, brain takes complexity and, uh, and, and presents it in a beautiful way that does get people invested in these stories. Um, we appreciate you joining our community tonight. And I want to thank uh, Sybil Francis again for the uh, introduction and Daniel uh, Rothenberg for uh, helping uh, gather us all. and. Um, uh, uh, Awista Ayub for uh, the support of the New America Foundation. Um, and we're just uh, so grateful to have your time and we can't wait to see what your next curiosity will be. Um, we will be tuning in and uh, ready to applaud you in the next phase of your creative journey. So thank you everybody for being with us tonight. Thank you so, so much.